There we go. Hey all, we're gonna get started here soon. Um, I'll let uh, Rolando. I'll introduce myself. Introduce though. himself, but I Absolutely. just want you to stay muted, and uh, if you type your questions in the chat, and then at the end, um, after about forty-five minutes, um, we'll be able to start answering questions. But I want to get Rolando started because he has so much to show you. I've had a lot of a lot of material to plow through, so <laughs> it's a it's a bit ambitious for forty-five minutes and. So not only what I got in, but also the pain about the things that I had to leave out. But, you know, we can always do another one, I suppose, you know. So, all right. So I'm going to just, uh, just to get this going, I'm just going to share my, share my screen here on, all righty. And uh, can you guys see the wonderful Clara Peller there? Yeah, all good. Yeah. All right, wonderful. So that's my title for this. Where's the beef savoring relics of America's fast food chains? This is not all about Wendy's, by the way. You will not see Clara Peller again, but um, I thought this was an, 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 a neat way to sort of frame this. Um, my interest in this stuff goes back uh, a very, very long time. Um, I think like, as it does for all of us, I, I think going back to, to childhood and sort of noticing these places and then of course noticing how they change. I think that the reason, one of the reasons why I think fast food with all the you know, complexities around the discussion around fast food and its legacy and its contributions to society is that for so many of us, it's, it, you know, these places uh, are tied intimately to a time and place in our lives, to where we were as a country, as a people at, at a point. And it just gets sort of like bathed in sort of nostalgia. And um, I absolutely love this stuff. Whenever I'm on the road, I'll, I'll uh, let's see here, uh, let me switch a slide there. Uh, that's uh, me and uh, some friends there, a friend of mine, an old buddy of mine outside of Wendy's in uh, Queens. This Wendy's was on uh, Queens Boulevard. This is the Wendy's that was actually converted into McDowell's for coming to America and Iowa in 1988. And I always felt that, that there should have been a plaque there that said this movie was filmed here. But in fact, they ended up demolishing the place and there's condos there now. So that tells you uh, the value that you know, society holds a lot of these places, unfortunately. Uh, and that's me at a McDonald's in Milford, Connecticut, which is quite possibly my favorite McDonald's everywhere, anywhere. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the reason I'm here tonight, the reason that, uh, you know, we, we've connected is I think it's been basically my, my Instagram account. I don't know how many of you follow me there. And if you do, I'm grateful for that. Um, it, that's an account that I started several years ago. And over the past couple of years, it's kind of just like taken off. And what I do there is just basically share, um, you know, finds from my retro travels, you know, where I go in search of these places, not only fast food, although I have a real passion for fast food, but anything um, that's interesting, that's vintage, it could be a diner, it can be an old motel, you name it, uh, I'm into it. And, um, and on, the on the road looking for it, roadside Americana, as we like to call it. Um, so that's where you can find me on Instagram. I also have a Tumblr, which is basically a version of my Instagram. And uh, I'd like to at some point start a newsletter and a more robust website and all kinds of things, but one step at a time. So let's start right now with the McDonald's. Somebody say McDonald's, right? And here is uh, the background image there is from a McDonald's up in Waterbury and some different images from some of my the spots that I visited over the years. Uh, McDonald's, of course, is, is such, a, such a fascinating place uh, for me, and I think for all of us. I mean, it is sort of like the big one. And let's start at the first one, of course, the real McDonald's land, if you will. And of course, that is um, what began uh, 1937, was moved in 1940 to San Bernardino. And that is, of course, the McDonald's, um, the, the octagonal building uh, that was built by the McDonald brothers, right? And in 1948, they made their switch. You know, and decided to uh, pare down that menu and focus on hamburgers and cheeseburgers and, and potato chips, not fries right away. Shakes, of course, shakes being very important to the story. And that location today, uh, the original McDonald's is now uh, owned by a fellow by the name of, 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 of uh, Albert Okura, who is the founder of the Juan Pollo chain of rotisserie chicken restaurants. And he is, um, he is definitely a devotee of all things Ray Kroc. He, he holds a man as a hero. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And some of the things you see here, uh, the signage, uh, the Matt Tonight uh, sign uh, and sort of the relics of the old McDonald land playgrounds are all available for you to see at this McDonald's. Uh, the entire 
the building itself is not the original McDonald's. That was torn down a long time ago. And um, Okura took over the building in 1998, bought it. Um, and uh, he is an interesting guy. He is revital. He's actually a force of, of preservation and revitalization. I mean, he bought the town of Amboy on Route 66. He owns Roy's, the iconic Roy's, which recently got, as you know, the signage got restored. Um, and, he, and the headquarters of Juan Poyer are located right here. And I think that he considers that good luck because this is where uh, McDonald's began. And he has a very impressive collection, some of, the, some of the things that he acquired, some of the things that are donated to the restaurant. You see these old patches and little um, little things from the McDonald's of uh, the 70s and 80s. Uh, that's an original McDonald's barbecue, which is what it began as, uh, an old menu. And of course, the hot apple pie, which is something that I uh, remember and miss very much. They still sell them, but they're baked. I, I love the fried ones. Um, they, they, are apparently, uh, they are apparently available in certain locations. You can get them apparently, and I was told, in um, Hawaii, but uh, here you can enjoy the old carton. And uh, we'll go from here. Of course, the, the multi-mixers, the Prince Castle multi-mixer, um, which is what Ray Kroc uh, was selling. And it, and it is the purchase of these multi-mixers by the McDonald brothers, Dick and Maurice, uh, that brought uh, Ray Kroc here nosing around in 1954. And he quickly realized that um, not only would McDonald's restaurants be a good place for his uh, multi-mixers, they'd be a good place for his vision and for his uh, ambitions to be fully realized. And my goodness, were they, and were they quickly. Um, some other little tidbits from that McDonald's, the McDonald land cookies and old speedy cups and all kinds of good things. That brings us of course to Downey, California. And that is of course, um, an, a very, very early McDonald's, pre Ray Kroc, the third franchise. Um, it's an absolute beaut. Um, it is a, a true wonder and it almost ended up disappearing. Um, it was not taken over by the, by the McDonald's Corporation until 1990. And at that point, it was just one of these leftover um, red and whites as they call them because of the, uh, the color scheme and the tile outside um, that uh, were essentially um, not, uh, they weren't economically viable, right? I mean, there was no inter interior seating. There was no drive-through. Drive-throughs, of course, is where you make the bulk of the money. So McDonald's had an issue with this place and they were kind of angling to get rid of it. Uh, the 1994 earthquake gave them the excuse. Uh, the building suffered damage, although they were always very mysterious about what kind of damage it suffered. There was, and then they announced, we're gonna get rid of it. We're gonna tear it down. Fortunately, people fought back, preservationists, low people in the community, and um, it ended up being saved. McDonald's restored it. Uh, they even opened up a, a museum there. Uh, and that wonderful vibe from the 1950s, it's probably the best place to go uh, if you want to really capture what a McDonald's uh, experience was like in the 1950s. Uh, that is, of course, good old Chef Speedy, the symbol of the Speedy service system. Uh, this is a very quirky one. Um, this sign, um, as Martin True wrote in his book, um, is uh, almost like a towering mutation of the original Stanley Meston design. Uh, there's, it's really a, a tall sign and a very slender uh, arch. And Speedy, it looks like he's about to jump off that thing, right? I mean, he's going to take a plunge into the parking lot. It's very interesting to see. Um, and it was built several years after the location opened. And it came up during the tail end of the, of, of the Speedy period. A few years later, Speedy would be gone. Uh, this is a photo of Mr. Croc at, uh, from the museum at that McDonald's. He's wearing a shirt that I wish I had, uh, that I'd love to wear tonight. I'll have to troll eBay for it. Um, an original door from the Hamburger University uh, in Elk Grove Village. Of course, um, people have always thought of that university in the beginning, people thought, well, you know, that's probably just a marketing gimmick, but it's a true place where people go to learn how to run a McDonald's. And it's graduated hundreds of thousands of people who've gone on to very successful careers uh, as entrepreneurs running their own McDonald's or multiple McDonald's. The museum, the, um, the school itself, uh, where you get your Hamburgology uh, degree, moved to Oak Brook in 1980. Three. Another wonderful relic is this one in Pomona, California. A uh, bit of a drive from Downey, but still rather significant. Uh, now, this beauty has been here since uh, 1954. It was the seventh McDonald in the system, um, which was promising in its advertising that it would be coast to coast very soon. Um, old ads for it. Uh, this appeared in the paper just as it opened. Um, what I love is that you can see in that ad on the left, 
Uh, it says, don't be misled, look for this trademark, Speedy. Hi folks, I'm Speedy, the McDonald trademark. There are many imitations of the McDonald system. Unless you see me in bright neon lights on all paper cups, bags, etc., you are not in an authorized McDonald's self-service system. Drive in, signed Speedy. So Speedy, uh, that was your sign that you were at a real McDonald's because this was a very successful uh, venture. And, um, and people were basically ripping off the concept, which I'm gonna show you in the, uh, an example of that, of what I believe to be an example of that in the next slide. On the right, uh, quickly, this is uh, Urge Burger, which opened in this location in 1983, about 15 or so years after this was no longer a McDonald's. And uh, multiple businesses have moved in here. Uh, of course, now it is a, um, it's a taco stand, but it was also, it's a donut place, but it was also a taco stand and a couple of other things. You can still see the original uh, shape there, that old Stanley Meston design that he worked on with, uh, with Dick McDonald is still preserved. The top of the arches have been shorn off. This thing is not a McDonald's. Don't think, it, I know it's not a McDonald's, but this is out in Bellport, Long Island. And it's probably from the 50s or 60s. Uh, I first noticed it once, you can see it from the LIRR. I was coming back from a trip out east and I was like, what is that thing? And I next day I drove out to take a photo of it. Uh, it is unfortunately not a McDonald's. You can tell it doesn't have a, many other touches. It's a crude ripoff, um, but clearly it never got on the radar of McDonald's uh, corporate. Uh, it, is still, it is still there. How about that? Um, from here, we will go march in time a few years to Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, I visited this McDonald's back in July of 2019. And uh, to get here, I was on a whirlwind trip um, all throughout the Midwest. Oh, oh, that all began because I wanted to see a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket. I'm going to talk to you about that. But I figured while I'm out there, I'm also going to try to get to see this uh, this McDonald's. And this is the 91st McDonald's. It's one of three original Speedies that are left uh, shining in the wild. And it's a beauty. I mean, there you go. There's Speedy at night. I shot that around 1 a.m. I was racing to get there. Uh, I had driven straight from St. Paul, Minnesota, just hoping that I would get there before they closed because I would not have another shot of shooting the neon on that night. I got there right around 1 a.m. They were still open and I got the picture. Um, there's another one right there. The building that is not an original nest and that is of course a one of the nine, the probably late 2000s, uh, one of the classic buildings that um, sort of replicated that original 1950s flair. Another shot there from during the day. Truly really a nice one. Uh, from there, we will, and, and it's actually still in, in the same family, and uh, they cared greatly for it. Uh, back in 2005, they were talking about, they, when they took down the sign briefly for repairs, there was a panic in the community. So they know what they have there, and they're treating this one well. I'm not worried too much about this one, at least not right now. Um, then single and ready to McMimble. We're talking about the single arch period. Notice uh, who is missing, our friend Speedy. He's no longer there. He has gotten the heave ho, but McDonald's has moved on. Um, the neon is also gone. You've got, flor you've got yellow plastic covers, fluorescent bulbs uh, doing the lighting. And now it's really starting to become the golden arches. We're starting to get to what uh, it is uh, today. The parabola, however, is still there. Uh, there's my little tribute to Speedy. Uh, he wasn't entirely uh, tossed out. Um, he, of course, officially he was gone, but a lot of, obviously he survived in franchises. And I found newspaper articles well into the 1960s, little columns that were published by local McDonald's in, in, in the newspaper uh, that were signed Speedy and used as graphics. So he, even though he may have vanished around 61, 62, um, he kind of lingered and of course had a, a big afterlife as, as we all know. Uh, when I saw this, I completely freaked out. Uh, a single arch sign, this was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I shot this back in March, 2013. It is unfortunately now gone. The franchise uh, owner, uh, Kristen Fraser, uh, wanted to get, get basically get rid of it. And it was uh, free for anybody to take. Um, no, they were no longer interested in maintaining it. It was complicated, the parts were hard to find, or so they said they wanted to get a new sign. Um, I tried to connect the folks at Juan Pollo and, uh, and Albert Acura's people with this sign so we could get it out to California. I thought it would have been a nice addition to that museum in San Bernardino, but um, it ended up in the hands of a fellow by the name of Mike Fountain who owns a McDonald's in at least he did back in 2016 in Allentown. He's collected uh, set thousands and thousands of pieces of McDonald's memorabilia, and he would like to open a museum and have this be obviously one of the, one of the, if not the centerpiece of it, an actual um, single arch. Uh, very, very rare these days. 
Uh, that's me joyously outside the single arch uh, in 2013, a photo that I treasure. Um, here's another single arch, uh, slightly different, uh, down in Winter Haven, uh, Florida. Visited this guy uh, back in December, and it's been on my list ever since I first saw it on Deborah Jane Seltzer's site years ago. I'm like, I've got to get this. And I finally got it in December. Um, it opened, this McDonald's opened February 22nd, 1963. They cut a ribbon of money. Uh, at the grand opening, and it's not a surprise because I'm sure this location has made a great deal of money. And the uh, the friend, the owner, uh, wrote at the time, "This building itself is designed to indicate the dignity, respectability, and responsibility of a restaurant, quote unquote, key to serving the family trade." Um, so, and it was as you can see from the newspaper article, it was a, it was still a uh, double arched building. It was it was still a classic mess in design. Um, there's another one in Magnolia, New Jersey. I, I posted on Instagram about this a couple of years ago. It, it got the attention of NJ.com. They, they wrote a whole article um, on on the survival of these of these old single arch signs. You can find it very easily on uh, if you do a quick web search. Magnolia, New Jersey, out in southern New Jersey, and there are beside Magnolia, we have six other. Uh, crest signs, uh, as documented by Deborah Jane, um, and all of them, about one in Akron, still has the actual crest. And what do I mean by crest? Um, the crest is the crest of the McDonald brothers, the McDonald's family. The McDonald's family crest was briefly added during that single uh, arch period. Uh, it's kind of ironic because in 1961, uh, when these signs begin to go up, uh, this is the year that uh, the McDonald brothers get their payoff. Ray Kroc is essentially tired of dealing with them, and he's got his 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 ambitions for for expanding the chain, and they're in the way. And so that sign, um, so he he buys them out for 2.7 million dollars, and they get a crest on a sign. It's interesting. I don't know whether it, there's anything causal there, but it's just interesting that that was going on in the background. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, March 1st, 1963, this is patent, this is tr this trademark is filed, and then the big double arches uh, emerge, um, an icon is born, uh, that was, uh, again, that was filed in March 1st, 1963, and this particular one, the black and white image, um, is built in Vestal, New York opens April 4th, 1963. So they, are, they start to put these up right away. The single arch sign is forgotten. The buildings are uh, still red and white. They still have their arches. Um, here's another one on the left. This was in Rialto and Route 66. That is in California. That one sadly is now gone. Um, these photos come from the collection of my friend Larry Coltrera, uh, who is of course an expert and authority on diners. And he shot these in Massachusetts in the 1980s. The one on the left is from Lowell. It was replaced in 1984. And uh, on the right, this is quite interesting. Uh, this is one. This is one that's in Dorchester. That was in Dorchester. That photo is from 1991. And as you can see, it's one that I've I've seen that vert that sign before that style, but never with uh, you know the sort of the, the tubing there in the middle to represent the roof of the building to sort of like to ape the actual uh, logo from that period, which is which is actually very cool. I, I wish I could find one with, that has that uh, feature in it. Very interesting. Um, that's Waterbury, Connecticut, shot this last summer. Uh, I just like it because it's just what a McDonald's was back in the 70s and 80s when, when I was a kid. Um, some other of these the big arches here, um, photos from various places around the country. Um, I show you this ad for the filet of fish from 1965, not so much because I want to talk about the filet of fish or how it came from a franchise, but rather because you know you could see as recently as late as 1965, the building is still being used in advertising. It's the building less than the logo that is what people associate with McDonald's. Speedy is gone, the building is telling the story, but the building is running into some trouble. Uh, here's a newspaper headline from the late 60s and there were dozens, hundreds of them published all around the country. Uh, McDonald's, what was cool and innovative and exciting and, and, and optimistic in the 1950s um, was not that by the time the 1960s came along. Uh, these futuristic buildings and the, the wild shapes and styles uh, began to be associated with just the roadside, with roadside excess. They were seen, increasingly seen as tacky. And while they may have been popular, uh, those who had were in a position to, to decide uh, in community zoning boards 
uh, did not want a McDonald's or if they, they, or if they were going to have a McDonald's, it wasn't going to look like that. And, um, and so the arches were in trouble. And uh, we go from arches, uh, we go from arches jutting out of buildings to shingles covering everything up in brick. Uh, this is from um, a quote from a, um, a photo that appeared in the paper in Tustin, California, 1969, the fall, August of 69. Traditional golden arches have been abandoned at the request of city officials, right? Um, and what have they been replaced with? Well, as you can see a little bit there, you can see an early Mansard building in the back there of that picture. And that, uh, in th that same style of M uh, that I showed you earlier that Larry shot up in Massachusetts in the 90s, you can still find another one of those in Greenwich, Connecticut, still intact. The building, however, is new. Um, here are some early mansards. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's not talked about enough, but the, the person who came up with that design, according to Philip Langdon's very good book, which is right here, I strongly recommend you read it, Orange Roots, Golden Arches, was a uh, architect, Donald E. Miller. And, um, McDonald's is encountering all of this difficulty um, in zoning boards and in communities, and they can't get these buildings built. And so Miller comes up with this Mansard concept uh, when the uh, image is shown to, a design is shown to Ray Kroc, he says, that's what I want. When can we have these drawings? Um, it's quite interesting that in, 19, in 2004, the late Jim Cantalupo, who was running McDonald's at the time, uh, one of the first things that he did in his role as McDonald's boss was get rid of that damn roof. So in between that moment, uh, Ray Kroc in the late 60s and Cantalupo in 2004, you have the Mansard era. And uh, we see its evolution here just in one year, August of 69, you have a man, an early Mansard, not double Mansard with some, with some arches sticking out of the roof. Another one in September, by December, we have a, a, what's a little bit more of a recognizable Mansard roof. Um, here's a photo of the Harlem McDonald's. It was at 125th Street and Broadway taken from the subway, um, the elevated subway. And I present it uh, because it shows you one of the, the things that, one of the values that the, the Mansard brought. It was not only a, a design that would be recognizable from the roof that looked uh, suburban, uh, that looked like it could blend into a community rather than those garish 50s designs. It also concealed all kinds of equipment, which is pretty useful when you have to build a, a much larger uh, restaurant. Uh, people are no longer sitting outside. They're now eating indoors, right? So, so there you go. Um, here's an old newspaper photo showing this quirky McDonald's sign. This is sort of a V-shaped one. Uh, there are a few of them still around the country, this one being up in Connecticut. And I was intrigued that McDonald's itself chose to use one of these signs in a press release last year uh, about, um, about how McDonald's was giving free meals to healthcare workers. Uh, you got a... Um, Green uh, Mansard, we, we see some of those here and there. An earlier one, a slate one uh, down in, um, I believe this was in Virginia, I shot that last year. And this, this one here, I like it. It's, this is a great location, one of my favorites. It's in Milford, Connecticut. I, I think it, it is like all of them destined for destruction, uh, but it was still there as of uh, back in September. One thing I like is that you can actually drive right through, right under it. It's almost like an amusement park, go right under the, the Golden Arch. But what's great about this one is that it has an old play place that has a lot of the McDonald Land characters. Mary McCheese is still there. Um, you've got an original style, and certainly an 80s style uh, play place with the, the old seating. You don't really see that kind of you know hard plastic seating anymore at a McDonald's, but there it still is. Um, all kinds of touches, Hamburglar, just, just a wonderful kind of place with lots of great detail. This McDonald's, which is in off the Garden State Parkway is another one that I love. This was a tip from a reader on Instagram who said, check it out. And uh, there are many McDonald Land characters there. Uh, here they are by the drive through and uh, inside as well. You've got Grimace and uh, Hamburglar and others in the seating area. Kind of a quirky one. Um, this particular one I learned about recently. I liked it because it was a simple Spartan um, McDonald's number 3836 uh, opened in 1976. Uh, it was untouched. I arrived at 620 on March 21st of this year to photograph it. Um, at 6 p.m. that day, as you can see from the sign, it closed for good. I was told by a employee in the parking lot that it was about to be demolished and it would be gone in one month. So I'm glad I got to that one when I did. That one is simply the one that I grew up with, which in the 1980s, of course, got a, this, the obligatory sunroom. Um, 
Speedy is back in the 90s. Uh, McDonald's is embracing nostalgia. It's sort of like uh, tying itself to its heritage. This one is down by Coney Island, one of the um, retro Speedy's locations still there. Um, one of my favorites. And this one's in Mount Frame, uh, New Jersey. Um, it is still there, but it's been muted down. Um, McDonald's sort of took away the red and white scheme. They took away some of the retro flourishes just a little bit, dialed it back a tad. Now it's, it's been, it's been it's sort of a, the gray box approach applied to one of these retro buildings. And pop, but it's still a nice one and, and it's still a, one that gives you some flavor of uh, vintage McDonald's. Um, these are the McDonald's townhouses and what made them a townhouse was that they were basically in the city. The first McDonald's that opened in uh, New York City, uh, they were townhouses, they were called townhouses. This one is in the White Plains Mall in White Plains, New York. And here's another one. Uh, this was in Forest Souls, Queens, now gone. This is the first McDonald's in New York City, in correction, in Manhattan. It opened in 1972, opened by a fellow by the name of Lee Dunham, who was a um, African-American entrepreneur, a former NYPD cop who studied, went to business school on the side, raised enough money, and uh, worked really hard to get somebody to finance a business of his, and the McDonald's Corporation was interested and willing to work with him. So were banks, and he opened up this McDonald's in in uh, nineteen in uh, March twenty first, nineteen seventy two. And at one point, it was number three in the nation in sales, according to an old article I read. Uh, and his family is still running McDonald's, not this one. This one is unfortunately now gone. Here's a look at the inside of it. Uh, it had that sort of local. Um, I guess perhaps playing off the Apollo, which is nearby. This is back in, in the days when McDonald's, one of the ways that they would distinguish themselves in communities was they, they were, uh, franchises were encouraged to add local designs and touches and history exhibits to the McDonald's. And this is what they did there. This McDonald's, um, since uh, it has since been renovated, but it's on 96 and Broadway in Manhattan. I always loved it because of the crazy neon. Should have played a video there, but it's really, really very cool. Um, and at one point, uh, it was in such demand. They were, they were selling, they were going through so many burgers. It was brand new in the early 70s and New Yorkers had never seen such a thing. They even had a, a guard outside and they would clean the sidewalk between 95th and 96th Street just to keep it looking good, this being the 1970s. Um, this quirky McDonald's is in an old mansion. This is on Long Island. I absolutely love it. I visited it the other day. And uh, this, uh, this uh, mansion was set to be demolished. Uh, McDonald's bought the property and they didn't want the mansion. Preservation is fought back. And then something of an echo of what would happen a little bit later in Downey, uh, they decided to keep the building and build a McDonald's in it. Opened in 1991 and it's still there. April 13th, 1991, it was the um, 12,000th location. Uh, this is of course the Big Mac Museum in um, Pennsylvania uh, where uh, Jim Delegati came up with this concept um, and uh, came up with it in 67, it was very soon very quickly spread throughout the chain, had Ray Kroc's blessing. Um, to him, we owe to all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, and so on. Isn't that cool? And that is still there. Um, so as you can see, uh, McDonald's today, of course, is not what it used to be. I love this meme uh, about how McDonald's grew up to become a middle-aged, a depressed middle-aged adult, which is kind of funny. Um, and then there, this one, I, I'm just throwing this one in. This is in Europe. Uh, but there are a number of these over there and uh, they have, they're sort of like, I, I saw them described as deconstructed mansards. They're brand new modern buildings, but they echo and they pay tribute to the mansard look. Uh, they're still recognizable as McDonald's. We did not go that way in the United States. They wanted to, they've gone through several designs, not this, and it's too bad. I think that's a missed opportunity. But uh, moving along, and we're running short on time, so I'm gonna to have to start plowing through here, but we've, we're, we're doing Burger King. Burger King is riding a nostalgia wave. This is um, a quick history of the, of the evolution of the logo. The one on the left is the 69 one. Uh, the one on the um, middle bottom is the 94 one. And then of course the one, the swirl that has just been discarded for the one on the right, which is kind of a cross between the 69 and 94. I first noticed this going on at a store in Danvers, Massachusetts. I saw somebody post about it on Instagram and I was like, what is going on with this? Is this an old sign that's been uncovered? But it wasn't. Uh, this was a store that rolled out the concept a few months before um, Burger King itself was ready to talk about it. And the stores are cool. Uh, they've got a nice warm, warm hues. 
um, the earth tones, uh, they've got wood everywhere, they've got this cool neon hamburger sculpture on the roof. They're actually very cool and worth seeking out if there's one near you. They even brought back uh, Little King, and Little King was, uh, Pillsbury did not like Little King, Little King was dispatched with very quickly after Pillsbury took over McDon uh, Burger King in the 60s. Uh, but the king would come back, of course, with friends like uh, the Duke of Doubt and sure sick a lot of burger thing and all that in, in, the, in the 70s. McDonald's answer to the kingdom, the answer to McDonald land. But uh, that little king is still being used in a vestigial way at McDonald's. Uh, so aren't you hungry? There you go. Even a, even a, even a COVID era shield um, with the new logo. The old logo. Aren't you hungry for nostalgia now? I sure am. Very, very cool. Uh, some exterior shots of, an, of another new Burger King with the with the with the retro look in um, also in Massachusetts, and then of course an old '70s shingle abandoned up in Monticello, uh, New York. Um, this place. This is a Google uh, image. Uh, was. I think possibly uh, the last McDonald's in the country that still had the 1969 logo, forgive me, Burger King in the country that had the 1969 logo. Burger King did a great job of expunging it from the land uh, and it's been replaced. Uh, but in the back, uh, there is still a smaller one on a tower, at least there was in the most recent Google image. And that may well be uh, the last of that generation that's out there, even though the new ones are now starting to roll out. I'd love to check that out. Uh, another McDonald's in Monsey, New York. Uh, I keep saying McDonald's Burger King in Monsey, New York. That is now the Kosher Castle, but still has traces of it. And uh, an old trace of the old Burger King logo at a, at a Burger King in, um, in New Jersey. Uh, this one's down in Pennsville, New Jersey, and it still maintains some of those uh, vintage touches. The, the old Burger King Kids Club, which still used an iteration of the of the older logo and an interesting uh, play area inside. All righty. Um, so from here, we will move on to part two. Forgive me, I'm just uh, quote unquote switching reels here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see, give me a moment. Uh, let's see. All right, present. Okay, enter full screen mode. All right, there you go. I hope everybody can see that. Uh, this is McDonald's, of course. This Burger King uh, is out in uh, Illinois. Uh, it's from 1965 or so. And uh, it does have that classic look that was developed down in Miami uh, back in the 1950s. Um, it's still, it's an original, it's still there. Um, and uh, the handlebars at, at which were added in to the design of, of Burger King's back in the 50s um, were at one point missing, but they were re restored at some point. I've seen photos of this location from the 1990s that don't have the handlebars. Those handlebars, of course, uh, had served no purpose whatsoever uh, beyond uh, a marketing visual one. Uh, it's just using modernism to market uh, fast food. Uh, and I visited that out in Naperville, Illinois back in 2018 is when I visited this location. This one is in Quincy, Mass. It does not have the, um, the brackets, but it's still there. Some other shots of it. And this is the original, the first McDonald's and uh, the first Burger King in, uh, in Miami at 3090 Northwest at 36th Street. It is now a, obviously they sell cars there. The, the, the original, the first, um, the, the, the business that's considered the first one was moved, but this building um, is still operational and it's still uh, it's still there, which is uh, which is kind of cool. Has not been demolished. Uh, moving on to Burger uh, to Pizza Hut real quick. Um, I generally have, have not I didn't go. I'm, I'm not including Howard Johnson's or any place where you have to use silverware, right? Um, but I'm including Pizza Hut mainly because uh, I love what they're doing. They have decided to rebrand uh, with their 1974 logo, and initially this was simply a a digital marketing play. But they've begun to take old restaurants, uh, certain franchises, and turn them into quote unquote vintage. Pizza Huts and uh, embracing our iconic Pizza Hut logo is recognition of a time and period where Pizza Hut unequivocally reigned supreme. Because And uh, we wanted to do that, the company said in 2018, because that is where the future is headed as well. They want to go back to those good old days. Why not be optimistic by going back to the old design? And stepping into one of these places is just an absolute trip 
uh, back in time. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, check that out. It's like, uh, basically, that, that is my fr Friday nights in the 1980s when I was a kid after basketball practice. That's what you did. You went to Pizza Hut and they looked like that. Uh, this one is uh, down in Virginia um, and uh, Kilmanarik. And this one over here is in, Tunk in Tunkahannock um, in, on Route 6 in Pennsylvania. Route 6 itself is a very fun place to go for a drive. And that's why I was up there and I stumbled upon it in May and I could not believe uh, what I was seeing. There's another interior um, look, uh, which is again, uh, a nice little uh, throwback. They've even brought back um, Pizza Hut Pete, who Lippincott and Mongolis got rid of because they wanted uh, uh, um, Pizza Hut to be less, um, quote unquote, ethnic. So they got rid of him, but uh, he did linger into the 80s in certain locations. And of course, you can still see him today down in San Antonio, a photo that Mike Carson shared with me. I really would like to shoot that um, one of these days. Moving on real quick to Wendy's. Uh, Wendy's, of course, started in 1969, late in the game, late in the hamburger game. But, um, and so Dave Thomas felt that the need here to sort of design stores that sort of stood out, even as other companies were beginning to sort of like cover up uh, their excesses. He puts, he's putting up these white and then later yellow buildings. This is down in Manassas, Virginia, shot this in just last June. And, uh, and there's a photo from, the Wendy's website of a very similar scene from the 1970s. Uh, he called them pickup windows because he didn't want to communicate the idea that uh, kids could hang around and cruise and, and mess around. Um, of course, uh, the, there's a bastion of these uh, yellow Wendy's that, are survived, that have survived down in Maryland and Virginia. I shot a bunch of them lately, uh, as you can see here. Uh, this one is in Glen Burnie. This other one is also in Glen Burnie, Maryland. Um, and just a couple of weeks after I shot it, it was uh, closed and the signage was trashed. I saw some photos online. It was very, very sad to see. And there, here's a really old Wendy's sign. You can see it's an earlier iteration of the Wendy's uh, character. And there is Wendy herself. She was Melinda Thomas, who became couldn't quite pronounce Melinda, so she she could she could say Wenda. Um, and when Dave Thomas was opening up uh, the chain, he wanted her to be the um, basically the, the the logo for it. His daughter was the mascot, uh, but you can't call it Wenda, so you called it Wendy. And there she stood for hours being photographed. They put pigtails in her in her, they put um, pipe cleaners in her pigtails uh, during the photo shoot her mom made a blue and white dress and that uh, she still survives to this day. And here's how the signage has evolved over the years. An interesting thing real quick about the, the current Wendy's logo, which was ro rolled out in 2013. Um, you can, if you look at Wendy's collar, you can make out what some people read as the word um, mom right over here, M, then the little pendant is the O and then here is the M. Uh, Wendy says that that is not um, that was not intentional, but some folks have noticed it, and they actually had to to talk about it. Uh, my friend Yanis Coretto from Hopeless Nostalgic shared this photo of an old um, the old newspaper tables, newspaper ad tables, which I I don't think are in any Wendy's. But if you do know of a Wendy's that has one, please let me know. I'd love to visit one. A couple of other shots there. We go now on to our friend Taco Bell. And uh, Tacos Raul, this was in Downey, Downey being this hotbed of, uh, of early fast food um, entrepreneurship. Um, this was the first uh, Taco Bell opened in 1962 by Glenn Bell. Uh, it, was, it was facing demolition uh, several years ago and Taco Bell corporate uh, took it over, moved it to Irvine and uh, now they're waiting to figure out another use for it. Um, here's an, um, what's interesting about this uh, style of sign, and I'm gonna go back a little bit here to th this one, the last of its kind, believed to be the last of its kind in Savannah, Georgia, um, is that it's called the, um, the, of the, the it's called the, the, the slumbering sombrero, the sleeping slum, uh, sombrero. Um, and uh, it, that is apparently a depiction of a, of a gentleman there sleeping under the hat and above the bell, which I did not know until I did some I learned that in research I was doing. Uh, this look did not rate very well in the 1980s, 
uh, in the chain, um, sort of when they when they put it before some groups, and they ended up going to this look uh, in the '80s, which is my favorite look. Um, this is sort of like uh, the modified the mainstream Mansour, the arch windows, still a, a Taco Bell, but sort of dialed back a little bit. This was during a time when Taco Bell was looking to go national. They were still largely a Southwestern chain, um, and this one, this particular sign is gone. You get a little look at the evolution of, of Taco Bell signs signage. Uh, Arby's, of course, uh, a favorite of mine. This one out in Sunset, uh, Sunset in Los Angeles. This one I only found recently. It's an old, uh, an old Conestoga wagon, Chuck wagon, Wendy, uh, uh, Arby's. It's in Clifton Heights, PA. Uh, checked it out the other day. Some of the detail is gone, but you still have the recessed lighting and it's still kind of still there, which is kind of extraordinary. So it's still the 60s down there. This one opened uh, around 1968, maybe slightly before that, another shot of it right there. It did lose its 10 gallon hat. This one is in Huntington Beach, uh, California, and it still has its, its uh, chuck wagon building. Uh, this one is in Hackensack, New Jersey, no longer in Arby's, but uh, it still has a lot of its original detail, in particular the stonework, uh, the recessed lighting and all of that. Remember, uh, Arby's is trying to appeal to a, uh, a, a classier customer and they charge a little more and the place had to look a little bit better. Um, by the mid 70s, they are, they are looking to change and uh, they introduced this particular look that's a little fancier. Uh, they sort of embraced that environmental style. And uh, this one was out in Pennsylvania. The building is gone, the sign is still there. And inside it was still very much a late 1970s, 80s um, Arby's. There's another Arby's in Williamsport, uh, PA. And the one here on the right is a modern design in Manhattan. There's two of these in Manhattan, but I do like that the RB sign on the right there does have some chasing light bulbs. And it is kind of, it is kind of fun. It has a retro feel. I, I'm pleased that they added that touch. Uh, we don't have much time here. So we are just powering through here. Um, we have Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, this, is, you know, the first franchise, 1952 Harmon Cafe, uh, Pete Harmon, this is in Salt Lake City, a building, is, the original building is gone, but it has been um, restored, and there's a museum there. Uh, the bucket began there as well, the actual uh, paper bucket. Here's some early buckets, uh, some early articles about the buckets going up, uh, one in the United States, another one in Canada, the one there in the middle is an early 64-ish era bucket uh, that survives in San San Jose, California. Um, how cool is that? Uh, this was the one that, this is why I took an entire trip to the Midwest two summers ago, because I wanted to get out to Grinnell, Ohio. Uh, I saw on Deborah Jane's site that this one was still there, uh, but unfortunately it is no longer there, right? Um, on the left here, I learned on her site that uh, the, the Sanders, uh, Harlan Sanders Cafe Museum down in Kentucky um, has built a revived, a sort of a, a replica old bucket and uh, sort of uh, an arrow sign there, which is kind of cool. Below you see what it looked like back in the 90s with the 80s era bucket. There's sort of this like bucket that has the 80, 80s iconography that also survives uh, in San Gabriel, California. And it's kind of cool to see it there. Some later era buckets there, this one featuring 1997, uh, early 2000s iconography. This is out in Brooklyn. So. They have, after a period of like sort of being loath to embrace the bucket, they're embracing the bucket again. Um, Roy Rogers uh, was a, um, at one point had certainly had national aspirations. There aren't that many left. Uh, first one opened down in Falls Church, Virginia in 1968. Um, and uh, this one, is out in uh, it's out in Ohio. It was a real, originally a Roy Rogers, became a Roni's, uh, which was the name of the lane on which the, the restaurant was located because they had a falling out with <clears throat> Roy Rogers Corporate, um, and uh, they ended up having to move when they had an issue with their lease, and they 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 basically took the sign with them and they rebuilt the building uh, to look like an old Roy Rogers as well, which is really fantastic, even though that's a brand new building. Uh, this is out in uh, just outside of Cincinnati and definitely worth uh, checking out. It's very cool. This was the last <clears throat> Roy Rogers in Manhattan. Um, and this is one that I stumbled upon the other day in Pine Beach, New Jersey. And um, it's been there since the late 80s. And, uh, when, uh, and then uh, Wendy's and Burger King, they opened up locations near there as well. And every hollow, and they, they, they basically told, they basically 
you know, told that Roy Rogers that, hey, we're going to come in here and we're going to eat your lunch. Well, both the Wendy's and the Burger King have closed. And so what this Roy Rogers location does every year is they put up these tombstones in tribute to um, the Burger King and Wendy's that they were able to survive. Uh, a follower of mine sent me these pictures and I would like to uh, go down there myself and see this pretty soon. Burger Chef. Um, as you can see, this location used to be a burger chef. You can see the sort of the, um, the general food era style of building. And there it is. This one is from the Indianapolis Star with the, the logo that they changed to in the mid 70s. Um, burger Chef goes to the kitchen. This beauty right here is perhaps the, the nicest original Burger Chef building you will see. So has the old kite and the diamonds. This is in, in, in Southern California, Rialto. Um, it was restored to its like 1960s perfection. Here are some, uh, by the way, some interesting little uh, ephemera from the, the now sadly closed Burger Museum down in Miami. Um, this uh, one right here was used in Mad Men. It played a role in an episode and so they restored it and you can still visit it and uh, there it still is. It's now called Chris's Burger, or at least it was when I, when I last checked. Uh, you can see plenty of, of, uh, of the old kites uh, around the country still serving different purposes. One in Ocala, the middle one in Petersburg, VA, and this one's up in West Haven, Connecticut. Here's what I shot just on Saturday. It's in Deptford, New Jersey. Basically only half the sign survives. I snuck in Arthur Treacher's here real quick. Uh, they too expanded quickly in the 70s, named after the, the British actor Jeeves, who was also Merrick Griffin's sidekick. Um, the, the chain has basically retreated again to its roots in, in, in Ohio, and these are two separate locations in, in that area, uh, one in Cuyahoga Falls and uh, another one uh, nearby, uh, the one on the left there with an actual lantern, the one on the right has a more authentic looking store, there's Arthur Treacher's himself, um, and some little tidbits from one of those locations. As we, as we approach dessert, I want to talk about Carvel. And uh, this particular Carvel is a real beauty. It's in Hackensack, New Jersey. It's sign is, it's on a tower, it's a tower sign it's from 1969. And the business itself has been in the same family since 1974. Uh, the son of the original owner reached out to me on Instagram and you know, shared some historical tidbits and uh, they love it. Uh, it's really quite a special, it's quite a special sign. John Margoli shot a very similar one in, ha in Havistraw. Uh, back in 1980, but that one, that particular tower sign is now gone, even though there is still a Carvel up there. This is a very blurry Trio 650 photo of the first Carvel location. This is where in 1934, as the company lore goes, Tom Carvel's truck broke down and uh, he sold out on a hot uh, Memorial Day weekend and he sold what turned into soft serve did a mean business and opened up a, a shop there two years later. This one would come along many years later, I believe 1947, the beginning of Carvel. Sadly, that building, the reason I'm relying on an old Trio 650 cell phone shot is that it no longer exists, but you can still find a, uh, a tribute to Mr. Tom Carvel himself in a plaque uh, right outside the Asian restaurant that replaced it. Um, what led to the demise of this particular location is what uh, damaged a lot of old businesses of, of that of, the, of these old buildings, which is of course, it was not very economically practical for the times and it wasn't simply generating enough money. Um, here we have two more Carvels, the one on the left in Havistraw, this one is in Yonkers. They knocked down the old building, but uh, they kept the cone and there it is. Um, Carvel out in West Hempstead, which is a beautiful intact sort of 1950s one, except a car drove into it last year. Um, it is currently closed and it has undergone some work. Uh, they're going to reopen very soon. I'm a little concerned about the neon because in the latest photos of the place that I've seen, the neon is currently not there. The cones are, we'll have to see what happens there. Here's some Carvel ephemera in Ardsley, New York. A um, couple of Carvels in the Northeast. And uh, this one is down in the last standalone Carvel. This is down in West Palm in Florida. And uh, the family actually came from, from New York. They came down here in, in 1973 and opened it, opened it up. 
this was a Carvel that Tom Carvel himself opened, and it was sort of a test Carvel for a while. They were test different products, uh, but they, this family uh, turned it into a basically year-round location. And uh, the cones were destroyed in a hurricane, and these are recreations that stand over it. Uh, here is a Carvel in um, Ridgewood, Queens. Uh, those uh, cones were damaged in a hurricane. Um, Hurricane Sandy, the cones are now gone. The facade has been sort of cleaned up and uh, modernized, but still retains some of its uh, modern flavor. This is beautiful. beautiful. One of my favorite pictures I've ever taken, Colonial Dairy Maid out in Colonial, New Jersey. Um, this was initially a Carvel, and this is Curve of Cream up in Albany, uh, was also a Carvel until 1952, so a very early one, still in the business, although unfortunately the neon is gone, it's now plastic. The signage is now plastic, and I just love this old sign, look for the searchlights in the sky, how cool is that? Um, as we run down on time here, because I do want to leave some time for questions, um, some wonderful old tasty freezes that I'm, I'm fond of. This one is up, there's only a, a handful left that are actually tasty freezes. One, of, one is up in Vermont and another one here is in Del Mar, New York. Uh, the owner of it sadly recently died, the one in, um, in Del Mar. And of course, we, we, can't fit, we can't talk about this without talking about my favorite. If you follow me on Instagram, you know how much I love Dairy Queen. And here is uh, those early 1950s buildings. This one is um, in Montvale, New Jersey, just 50 minutes from where I grew up. I had no idea it existed until a few years ago and uh, still going. Uh, this one is out in Butler, PA. One of my favorite pictures, if you follow me on Inside, I posted it a few times. I absolutely love it. It's uh, definitely a crowd uh, favorite. Uh, these are um, some of the, the period where Dairy Queen was using an, an Eskimo girl, a little Eskimo girl to sell their ice cream. Uh, the location on the left is still there, Grafton, West Virginia, even though the location has been uh, restored. And this, the one on the right is the Dairy Freeze, uh, which is in Quincy, Mass, right across from that old Burger King I showed you. Uh, but it's no longer, has not been a Dairy Queen for a long time, but there indeed, uh, the Eskimo Girl survives. This is the one down in Charlotte. This is the, this was the first Dairy Queen um, in, uh, I believe in the South. Um, the first Dairy Queen in North Carolina and the third oldest in the Southeast. Uh, that, that sign is unfortunately a recreation. Um, the, the, it sustained serious damage back during a tornado in 1994. One of them was knocked down, the other one was folded like a piece of paper. Um, and there was this period in the 50s where they were using this Eskimo character. Um, then in the 60s, the country fresh look began and little Miss Dairy Queen was rolled out with her holding her, her tray of treats. Uh, this one is up in Sackle, Maine. There's another one that's still in existence as Deborah Jane points out. Uh, but most of these sadly are, are gone. I would love to find one more out there in the wild somewhere, but most of these weather veins are gone. Um, this was this whole Dairy Fresh movement. This one uh, is in East Windsor, New Jersey, and I absolutely love it. It's just achingly beautiful um, uh, and does not have Little Miss Dairy Queen, but there is still a weather vane up there. Some other detail from that location. This location out in Iowa City, I love because that sign is actually a recreation. It was destroyed again, weather in a tornado. And the couple that own this place, that owns this place, Tracy and Scott Mac Mac McWayne, uh, through great cost and great effort and dealing with bureaucratic red tape, uh, they had that sign rebuilt, even though the original look for it, the original papers for the schematics for it were gone, they got it built. Um, and then there was another a flood <laughs> several years later and they were washed out, but they reopened. So they, this, this Dairy Queen has just hung on. Uh, the, these um, uh, ice cream cones on the pole, these did, um, these were not impacted uh, by the, the tornado. And so they are still there. So they're, they're still original. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's down in, in Florida. Um, and uh, it, it was opened up in the early 50s by Mary McGurk, a Chicago transplant. And she punked down 8,500 bucks and she opened up this beautiful Dairy Queen still there. They added hot dogs in 1983. And it's the very reason that I spent the night in um, New Smyrna, Beach because I wanted to photograph it during the day and at night. 
Uh, this one is a quirky one, uh, but one that I really do love. It's in Irvington, New Jersey. And um, here's another quirky one in Hackettstown, New Jersey, with more of a kind of a 90s kind of postmodern look with those lanterns, which I absolutely adore. Um, this one is in Holbrook, Arizona. Uh, there was a preservation battle around this one. Uh, Dairy Queen corporate wanted to get rid of that da Dairy Queen hamburger sign. Preservationists fought back, they fought the good battle and they were able to keep it. Uh, but a lot of the other, the, the other signage on the property, including this beautiful uh, ode homage to the 1980s in the land of Dairy Queen, we treat you right, um, that was painted over. But shot this back in 2013. This one is in Williams, Arizona with a quirky old sign. And this used to be a Dairy Queen, it's now a Dairy Palace. It was only a Dairy Queen for a couple of years, uh, but it is an absolute tre treasure. You can find it in Newcastle, Delaware. And I was just so excited to, to find it, um, to visit it uh, last year at the Golden Hour, last June. This Dairy Palace has been listed on the National Register for his historic places. And uh, a Delaware public media official quoted it as saying that it is very, very significant uh, for, as you can see, very little has been compromised here. So it's a, it's a real, real treasure um, and definitely one of my one of my favorites. And with five minutes to spare, and I haven't left a lot of time for questions, that's me in 1978 with Ronald McDonald. Um, you, can, you can find me on Instagram. You can find me via email if you want to reach out that way, the retrologist. And, uh, and that is that. And uh, I can, uh, let me see, I, I can hand over this. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen here. And uh, let's see. That's what I got. Thanks very much, everyone.